hearing a re All right, can we turn please to the book of Joel and chapter two? And we're going to read verses 28 down to verse 32. And we're going to be considering the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And so we'll just read this portion and then begin to consider it together. And so it begins this way, uh, Acts, uh, sorry, Joel 2, verse 28. It says, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit, and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. And again, God will bless that short reading from his precious word to us uh, this morning. It's a short passage and yet probably will take us our whole time because it's the most controversial passage in the book of Joel. And there's been much discussion about this because Peter quotes it extensively in his Pentecostal sermon. And uh, we'll see some of the difficulties that have arisen uh, in connection with that as we move forward today. But we just want to say that we're dealing with a section that began with the Lord as a result of their repentance beginning to bring restoration and blessing to his people. And what we saw last time was that most of the restoration and blessing we were considering was physical and material. In other words, the, the locusts had devoured their crops, and so God was restoring their crops. And so it was it was purely a physical thing that we were looking at, really, material and physical blessings. But now we're looking forward to a time of ultimate blessing and ultimate restoration. And this particular time, it'll be not just so much as material blessings, but there'll be a great spiritual blessing that will be poured out on his people. And, of course, part of that will be an outpouring of the Spirit of God upon all flesh. Not on selected men at selected times for selected duties, but it will be poured out on all flesh. And so what a wonderful thing uh, that this is moving as a way from the material into the spiritual. Uh, so th from this point on to the end of the chapter, we're considering future events future events, prophetic events, uh, the ultimate day of the Lord, and the ultimate restoration of God's people, Israel. And we're going to kind of break it down, really. this The rest of the book really goes like this. We have, uh, we might put it this way, a day of revival in chapter 2, verse 28 through 32. And then in chapter 3, verses 1 through 17, we're going to see a day of retribution where God is going to judge the nations for how they have treated his people Israel. And it is kind of interesting because we, we're watching right now how, uh, how the nations are treating Israel, and they're condemning them, they're doing all kinds of things, they're ridiculed, anti-Semitism is at an all-time high. And we're going to see next time, Lord willing, in chapter 3, God is going to deal with the nations over how he dealt with his people Israel. And they're going to be called to an account. There's a day of reckoning coming for the nations. So that's in verses, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. And then verses 18 through 21, we're going to see a day of restoration where the nation are going to be restored fully to the glory that they will have in the millennial kingdom. And we're going to see some of the, the beauties that will uh, be surrounding those people in the millennial age. So from this point on, the no question, we're all looking future. 
as we sit today. These are future events that are yet to happen. It all is connected with the, the answer of the Lord that we saw beginning in chapter 2, verse 19. It says, Yea, the Lord will answer and say unto his people. Okay, so this answer that God is giving to his people, remember they've come via this valley of brokenness and this 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 repentance, and now God is answering them. And he, he begins, as we've said already, by answering them in the physical realm, uh, by restoring that which the locusts had eaten. But now he, we're going to expand really into the latter days and how uh, God is really going to answer his people's cries in a very marvelous way in producing uh, great spiritual blessing amongst them through the giving of the Holy Spirit and, of course, through their restoration uh, to be the head of the nations rather than the heel of the nations. That is yet to come. Now, what is interesting is that in our Bible, uh, we're just continuing in chapter 2. Uh, so verse 28 is um, in chapter 2. But if you were reading in a Hebrew Bible, you would be now beginning chapter 3. And so it really does mark off, verse 28 marks off that that really this is very much a future blessing that's in view. A whole new chapter in the Hebrew Bible devoted to these future blessings. And so the future prosperity of the nation of Israel is in view. We mentioned these three sections, the days of revival, days of retribution, days of restoration. And what is interesting is that how all three sections, 18 through 32 of chapter 2, 1 through 17 of chapter 3, 18 through 21 of chapter 3, all conclude with a climatic reference to Zion and Jerusalem. Because we want to say this, right now the epicenter of a lot of the world's problems is Zion and Jerusalem. <laughs> That's that's a lot of what the conflict in the world is going on is about that little piece of real estate. All future blessings to the nation of Israel are going to be connected very definitely to Jerusalem and to Zion. So notice chapter 2, verse 32. And it shall come to pass that whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered for in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. And the Lord, as the Lord hath said, and in the remnant whom the Lord shall call. So Israel's deliverance will come actually when they're, they're gathered together actually in one place. And they're going to be in that place of Zion and Jerusalem surrounded by enemies. And they're going to call out to the Lord and the Lord is going to bring deliverance to them. So Mount Zion, Jerusalem, this is the epicenter of future blessings for the world. Uh, chapter 3, verse 17 Again, we want to just see the second section where, where the nations are going to be judged. And it says, so shall you know that I am the Lord your God. This is chapter 3, verse 17. Dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain, then shall Jerusalem be holy. There shall no strangers pass through her anymore. No longer shall, we, shall she be trodden on the foot of the Gentiles. The Lord is going to dwell in Mount Zion. And so this judgment of the nations is a prelude to his setting up his reign, his kingdom in Jerusalem, and no longer will Jerusalem be trodden on the foot of the Gentiles. Anybody visits there, uh, they're going to be visiting, as it were, to acknowledge Israel's place and Israel's God. And so uh, very different circumstances. Now chapter 3 and verse 20 and 21, but Judah shall dwell forever and Jerusalem from generation to generation for I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed, for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. So again, I want you to see Jerusalem and Zion are so uh, clearly the epicenter of future blessing for the world. Right now, it's the kind of, well, it's the the the, uh, the, the troublesome stone, isn't it? The, the stumbling stone uh, that we read about in Zechariah. Uh, for, for the nations, but it's actually going to be the seat of all blessing. So let's again just look at verse 28 and 29. I'm going to read them together because they really go together. And so it says, it'll come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions and also upon thy, the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. Notice it begins with this phrase, afterward. 
uh, and and of course it's a very important statement this is future it's afterwards uh, we we've already noticed that in chapter 2 verse 12 we had a now therefore also now saith the lord turn ye to me with all your heart with fasting weeping mourning and now uh, we have an afterwards so again it's stating that this is a future thing that's in view in fact um peter is going to quote from this passage but he's not going to use the word afterwards he's going to use the word in the last days okay so clearly a future reference is in view here and we've already said not only that will there be physical relief from the locust plague, plague and the recovery of material prosperity but there's going to be a spiritual revival among god's ancient people israel the lord will not stop his bless blessings with the literal outpouring of rain for the parched throats and the bountiful crops so that they can fill their stomachs with wholesome foods. Remember, he's going to store the rain and the latter rain. He's going to pour out that, but he's also going to pour out his spirit. And what's going to result is instead of their mouths being filled with food, their mouths are going to be filled with truth. Because notice it says, the young men would dream dreams. They're going to prophesy. It's all going to be divine revelation that's going to be filling their hearts and minds. And so on the one case, uh, pouring his rain, it's going to fill their bellies. It's going to make them prosperous. But now he's also going to pour out his spirit and he's going to fill them with spiritual food uh, to nourish them tremendously. Now, certainly the Old Testament has a rich record of the work of the Holy Spirit, but he was not poured out on all flesh under the old covenant. In fact, as you look at the Old Testament, it seems that the Holy Spirit only came upon certain men and certain individuals for certain tasks. And it, it wasn't a permanent giving of the Spirit either, because just as he was given, he could also be withdrawn from those individual men. And so we see, see it was very selective in the old covenant. Now we're looking at a new covenant where his spirit's going to be poured out on all flesh. Big difference. And so let's just uh, take a moment to look at the Old Testament and how the spirit worked in the Old Testament. And of course, the first person that's mentioned in the Old Testament, and I just recently was uh, studying this and reading this in Joseph's life, Genesis 41 and verse 38 He's the first individual in Scripture that it's mentioned that the Spirit of God was connected with this man. And so Genesis 41, verse 38 says, Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find such a one as this is a man in whom the Spirit of God is? By the way, isn't that a wonderful thing when somebody who's not part of God's people can actually recognize and acknowledge in somebody who is part of God's people, the spirit of God is in him. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? This is Pharaoh. This is, this is the man that, you know, is, is a pagan through and through, and yet he recognizes God's spirit is in Joseph. Oh, how wonderful it would be if people could recognize that about us, uh, could say there's something different about that person. And of course, there, there ought to be something different about us because just like Joseph, the Spirit of God dwells within us. And so what, what a tremendous scripture. Joseph is a man in whom the Spirit of God is. And again, he why was the Spirit of God in, in him? Well, uh, again, so he had certain responsibilities, right? He was to rule over Egypt. He was also a man who uh, was revealing secrets. Uh, that's what he was known for, a man who revealed secrets. And so so understanding God's mind and understanding his ways and, and also uh, serving in the capacity of rulership, he needed the Spirit of God to enable him to do those things. Now we look at Exodus 31, next reference. And this is another beautiful one. These are lovely references because there, there's practical application for us. And I want us to, to get that practical ap application. This is a man uh, who is filled with the Spirit so that he can 
build the tabernacle. And, and it says in um, Exodus 31, verse 3, it says, And I have filled him, speaking of Bezalel, verse 2, the son of Uri, I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and in knowledge and in all manner of workmanship to devise cunning works, to work in gold and silver, brass, and so on and so forth. And so here's a man, and I want you just to get this little thought. He is filled with the Spirit in order to build and beautify the house of God. Right, Because that's what he's doing. He's constructing the tabernacle, and he's making it beautiful, and he's building it and making it beautiful. And again, uh, how desperately do we need men today who are filled with the Holy Spirit for the exact purpose of being involved with the Lord Jesus in building the house of God and beautifying the house of God? And certainly the Spirit of God makes the house of God a beautiful place to be. When Christians are energized by the flesh, it makes the house of God a terrible place to be. <laughs> so we want to make sure that we're we're filled with the Spirit and we're building and beautifying the house of God. But again, just, just these amazing lessons that we can learn. Uh, look at uh, the book of Numbers now, uh, Numbers 27 and verse 18. This is a Spirit coming on individuals, not on all flesh, but specific individuals uh, for specific purposes. And so Numbers 27, verse 18, it says, The Lord said to Moses, Take thee, Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thy hand upon him. So here's uh, our man Joshua, and he was a man who was recognized. The Spirit was in him. And of course, he's going to need that. He's going to lead the nation in to victory, isn't he? And if we're going to lead God's people into victory, that victory is going to come in the power of the Holy Spirit. We need men who are spirit-filled men to lead God's people out of bondage, out of defeat, into victory. And Joshua is going to do that. And so wonderful to see that. Um, Judges chapter 6, uh, we see Gideon. Uh, again, another one who it tells us the Spirit of God comes upon them for certain acts of service in the Old Testament. It says, but but the Spirit of the Lord, this is Judges 6.34, came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and Abiezer was gathered after him. And so what's, what's God doing here? Well, he's bringing recovery, right? The people of God are, have been in bondage, and they need to they need recovery. The Midianites are coming in, eating up all the food of the people of God. They need, and so this man is being filled with the Spirit in order to bring about recovery. Uh, to, and the, that will be true of all the judges, uh, to bring a time of recovery. Oh, how we need recovery. Uh, there's been a lot of departure amongst God's people. We need days of recovery. And these days of recovery will be Spirit-filled men, will be men that will lead us in that direction. Uh, Judges 11, uh, we, maybe I'll just uh, quickly read them. This is Jephthah. Again, it says the same thing. Then the Spirit of God came upon Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead. So again, another one of the judges. Samson, we won't read all the references, but there are several occasions where it says the Spirit of God comes upon Samson. Verse 25 of Judges 13, the Spirit of the Lord began to move him at times in the camp of Dan between Zorah and Eshtiel. And we've studied Judges together. Spirit of God comes upon him to, again, to defeat the enemy and to do harm to the enemy. Oh, the enemy's coming in like a flood. How we need spirit-filled men who can do damage to the enemy's cause in our day. <laughs> it can, as it were, strike some blows against the enemy. Oh, boy, what a wonderful thing that would be. And, of course, we need spirit-filled men to do that. And then, of course, uh, we move into the era of the kingdom and the kings and first samuel 10 verse 9 and 10 we have saul a man who the spirit came upon him it says verse 9 and it was so that when he had turned his back to go from samuel god gave him another heart and all those signs came to pass that day and when they came thither to the hill behold a company of prophets met him and the spirit of god came upon him and he prophesied amongst them and then one more reference before we move back to Joel, and that is in 1 Samuel 16. In verse 13, it says, 
Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Notice verse 14. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And so what we can see here, clear pattern, that the spirit of God comes upon men for certain acts of service, maybe to help them with bringing about recovery, help them beautify in the house of God, help them rule for God. Uh, again, shepherds in, in God's assembly, they're part of what's being given them is the responsibility of rule. They need the spirit of God that they might do that well and wisely. And so certainly there's practical application, but the point is that he didn't come on everybody. He didn't come on all flesh. He came on certain individuals for certain purposes in the Old Testament. It wasn't a permanent indwelling. But now there's a promise that Joel is giving. And notice what Joel is saying back in Joel 2 and verse 28. He says, I'll pour my spirit upon all flesh. And so he talks about the fact that this effusion of the Spirit, this outpouring of the Spirit, will include all genders. And so he talks about your sons and your daughters, so male and female. So all genders are involved, all ages. Uh, it says uh, your old men will dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And then all classes of people, because you have servants, you have handmaids. And so the idea is this, that this born of the Spirit in these last days, it, it, will, it will not differentiate or give preference to certain ones. It's to all flesh. And so, again, remember, we're talking about a people who are repentant, <laughs> a repentant people. So it's not the unsaved people we're talking about here, but this is God's people, but the Spirit given to all flesh. And, and I wanted just to notice, too, just a little thought here that uh, in verse 28 and verse 29, twice we have this idea of pouring out my spirit. So it says in verse 28, shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit in verse 29. Also upon the servants, upon the handmaids in those days, will I pour out my spirit. So twice it's stated. And, and so the generosity of this giving of the spirit is emphasized by its double reference. And so he's he's going to pour out his spirit. And that, of course, is going to provide spiritual power, but also divine revelation and insights, because it tells us that uh, they're going to prophesy, they're going to dream dreams, they're going to see visions. So there's definitely going to be an understanding of divine things that is going to come to the nation through this outpouring of the Spirit. Of course, this, this word pour out, it derives its imagery from the heavy winter rains, uh, speaks of abundant provision, copious provision, God pouring out his Spirit. And of course, this the outcome of it, as we said, is a pervasive delight in divine communications. What they're about, prophecy, <laughs> dreaming dreams, visions it's to do with god's revelation is what thrills them and of course we would say today that one of the things about receiving the spirit of god is along with that comes a deep interest in the word of god and of course not just a deep interest in the word of god but also a delight in the word of god but also insights into the word of god just young men study last night we were talking about uh in first john that we have anointing and we don't need anyone to teach us. It's not that there's no value of teachers or uh, this is a waste of time having somebody teach you the book of Joel. It's not saying that, but what it is saying is the Holy Spirit, the, the author of the book is given to every believer. And every believer can get great insights from the scriptures. And isn't it wonderful when you see something in the scriptures and, and you're just in your regular devotions, you're reading the word and the Lord shows you some truth. And you think, well, I better just check with the commentaries to make sure I'm not in left field here. And you see that, yeah, yeah, exactly what God showed you has been shown to other men. And and again, but he taught you. you nobody else showed you. You saw it from, and, and isn't it wonderful? We often sing, Spirit of God, my teacher be showing the things of Christ to me. 
And it is wonderful that we have a teacher living within us. The 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 unction, the the the, uh, the anointing, is given to us, and so we have a deep interest in the scriptures, and not just knowing the scriptures, but also the Holy Spirit gives us a desire to obey the scriptures. And and he has such transforming power, and it's wonderful. I, one of the things I'm enjoying about this young men's Bible study is that we're talking about opportunities to put into practice the things that we're learning, and they're excited to just go and do it. And well, what a wonderful thing when you you see that in young people. By the way, that same thing should be seen in some of us older folks as well, should it not? Not just to know what God says, but how do I put this into practice? How do I move with this? Now, again, let me just say this, that in one sense, I wonder here in Joel, is, is the yearnings of Moses being finally answered here? I want you to look back to the book of Numbers just for a moment. In Numbers uh, chapter 11 and verse 29. Numbers 11, very interesting little scripture. And so we'll break in verse... Uh, 28, Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Moses, one of his young men answered and said, my Lord Moses, forbid them, because these two men in verse 27, Eldad and Medad are prophesying. And so Moses said to him, envious thou for my sake? Would God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them? Would that all God's people, the Lord's people, or prophets, and the Lord will put his spirit upon them. Well, that that longing in the heart of Moses is reaching its climax in Joel chapter 2, verse 28. I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. So, of course, we've got a couple of obvious questions that we have to ask about these verses firstly the order in joel seems to be radically different than other prophecies like ezekiel and zechariah so for instance joel is going to talk about um, the, the nation being regathered he's going to talk about the uh the the, the gentiles coming against them you know the invasion of the gentiles in the land of israel and and yet it talks about the spirit being poured out before it talks about all these events that we tend to think of connected with the tribulation period whereas when we look at other prophecies so let's just look at one like zechariah for instance um, we, we said ezekiel zechariah um, we could look at either one, but let's just for the sake of time, we'll look at Zechariah 12. And we'll notice in verse verses 9 and 10, um, it says in verse, well, beginning verse 8, that day the Lord shall defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. He that is feeble among them in that day shall be as David. The house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. It shall come to pass in that day I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I will pour upon the house of David, upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplications. They shall look upon me whom they've pierced. They shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. And so I want you just to get the simple thought that that in, in Zechariah, the tribulation and the attempt to destroy Israel occurs before God pours his spirit spirit of grace and supplication upon them. Whereas, as we read Joel's prophecy, you have this emphasis on the pouring out of the Spirit, and then we're going to go into this invasion of the land, the regathering of Israel, the nations coming. So we've got to ask the question, why is th that the case? Why is his order seemingly so different to other prophets? And then the second question that we have to ask and this is the big one. Was Joel 2.28 fulfilled on the day of Pentecost? Right? Because that's a, that's a big battleground. Believe it or not, there are three distinct camps concerning how to interpret Peter taking Joel's words 
and saying this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And so we've got to we've got to answer those two questions. The easier one to answer is concerning Joel's order. That's an easy one, because basically, from verse eighteen of chapter two, the Lord has been outlining his blessings in response to a repentant people. And so all he's doing is just unfolding the blessings. It begins with material and then he moves to spiritual. From <clears throat> verse um, 30, he's going to, of chapter two, he's going to talk about the events that lead up to that outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But he's but he's listed the, the blessing in connection with all the other blessings that will come upon a repentant person. And then he goes from there to the events that will lead up to it. So that will harmonize with Zechariah and all the other prophecies. Uh, so there are certain events that will precede this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He's going to deal with them from verse 30 onwards into chapter 3. Okay, does that make sense? So, so he's just he's just lumping the blessings together, and then he's going to talk about the things that will lead up to that time of blessing for the nation of Israel. So now we come to the more difficult question of what about Pentecost? So let's let's just take a minute to to look, uh, and maybe we need to stick a Bible rib ribbon in Acts chapter two because Peter quotes extensively uh, from this and we're going to be going a little bit back and forward between the two so acts chapter 2 stephen's uh, sorry peter's great sermon on the day of pentecost and of course he's been asked you know what's going on here uh, are these men drunk with new wine uh, you know, because they're they're speaking in tongues and again by the way uh, just without question the tongues they were speaking in were not gibberish, okay? Uh, it wasn't gobbledygooch. It wasn't saying Anna banana backwards. They were speaking in languages that they had never previously learned. Not just languages. Actually, the, the, the Greek word that's used is dialects. They're actually even speaking in local dialects without learning, by the way. Wouldn't that be wonderful? I mean, I've often thought that when I've been in places like India, how marvelous it would be if I could stand up without the headache of learning the language and be able to preach to them in their dialect. That would be a wonderful, wonderful thing, wouldn't it? I mean, I would I would love that. <laughs> and uh, uh, my son, when he learned Norwegian, to be able to preach in it, he said it was two years of a permanent headache. It would wonder, be wonderful to be able to preach Norwegian without two years of a permanent headache, wouldn't it? I mean, just would be a wonderful thing. Yeah, but uh, we just want to see that this is what's going on on the day of Pentecost, that they were speaking in definite known languages, and uh, they were they were speaking the uh, a specific topic, the wonderful works of God, and that wonderful works of God was connected with the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. So that it was very clear. And so as Peter answers them, um, uh, he he begins to quote to them uh, from the book of Joel. And so um, let me just find the exact point to break in here. Yeah, so um, let's look at verse 14 of Acts 2. Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, by the way, just an, an interesting aside here, he's standing up with the 11. That means that Matthias in Acts 1 was considered to be a genuine apostle, not a spurious one. He's standing up with the 11. That Judas replacement was real. It wasn't a mistake. It wasn't, oh, actually, that should be Paul. No, no. Uh, very clearly, he's standing up with the 11. So that's Peter plus 11 equals 12. Okay, we have 12 recognized apostles and they're corporately giving testimony, standing up with the 11, lifted up his voice and said unto them, you men of Judea, all you that dwell in Jerusalem, be it known unto you and hearken to my words, for these are not drunken as you suppose, 
seeing it is the third hour of the day. It's only nine o'clock in the morning. It's a bit early in the day for them to be drunk, right? So he says, um, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days. Notice he, he takes liberty here. He doesn't say come to pass afterwards. He, he says, what does that afterwards mean? The last days. Saith God, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons, your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids, I'll pour out in those days my spirit. They shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon and to blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, he quotes it extensively. There's one or two little changes that we're going to talk about that he makes that are very significant changes. Uh, but we, we, we want to ask the question, what, what about Pentecost? Was Joel's prophecy fulfilled? When he says, this is that which was spoken, is he saying this is a fulfillment? Now, it's kind of interesting. There are three main views. I'm going to go through all three views. It won't take long, but it will help us to at least see where people are coming from. So the first view that I want to think about concerning this portion is that it's called the normal fulfillment view. And so they, they are teaching, basically, that Acts 2 is a complete accomplishment of Joel's prophecy and that Peter's citation of the prophet is the normal sense of fulfillment. Uh, those who take this view, their difficulty is that there didn't seem to be things like the wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire, pillars of smoke on the day of Pentecost, right? So that's their difficulty. How do they deal with that? Well, they say, well, it's it, it's it's not to be taken literally. Literally, it's just metaphorical of disturbances in society and nature. <laughs> They're really good at saying, well, it, it, it really doesn't mean what it says. It means something else. And so they believe that everything was fulfilled in AD 70 with the destruction of Jerusalem. And so the people that hold this view, that it was a complete fulfillment view, their position, they are what we call preterists. They believe that everything was fulfilled in AD 70, and there's no future, in a sense, until Christ comes. And so there's there's no future for Israel. There's no last days there. They believe in replacement theology, or the posh name is super cessationalism, that basically uh, Israel have ceased, and the church has superseded them uh, in the purposes of God. And so this fulfillment of Joel, the pouring on all flesh is really the starting of the church and it's completely fulfilled. And that's the end of the story. Now, and I, I remember hearing a guy years ago when we were still in a church that was a millennial, I remember a guy preaching and he didn't apply the darkness and all this. He applied that to Calvary, you know, cause the earth was dark when in those three hours of darkness. And so basically he was saying, it's all fulfilled. God is done with Israel. It's over. It's finished. I want to just say I utterly reject that viewpoint. We're going to see clearly that verse 30, God showing wonders. We've just been spending several weeks going through the book of Revelation, and we have been witnessing the wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. And we'll, we'll point them out in a moment. Uh, but to say that all of Joel's prophecy was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, ignores certainly verse 30 and 31 is completely ignored. Okay, so we'll have to, we have to reject that. We can't accept that position. It, it, it's, it, it's completely ignoring those things. Okay, so that's the non, uh, the, the, the fulfillment view. It's already fulfilled, the now fulfillment view. Now the non-fulfillment view. So men like uh, Charles Ryrie, uh, who's very helpful in many, many things. He was a lecturer at Dallas Theological Seminary. 
and his, his position and many uh, along the Dallas Theological Seminary line, they, they believe that um, Peter could have used the term fulfillment in Acts chapter 2, but he didn't. In fact, he's already used the word fulfillment in Acts chapter 1, verse 16, where he says, uh, Acts 1, 16, Men and brethren, the scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. Jesus. And so he, he's he, he's not afraid of saying the scripture is being fulfilled. But when he quotes from Joel's prophecy, he doesn't say, he don't mention the word fulfilled. All he just says is that this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And so what he's what what this view says is that really there's just a parallel here between Joel and Acts. There's an abundant outpouring of the Holy Spirit evidenced by supernatural effects. For instance, Joel doesn't mention anything about speaking in tongues, but there, it, it is a supernatural thing. But it, he mentions dreaming dreams and seeing visions. Okay, so so we can clearly see that there's there's a difference between the two things. And so he just simply says that, and this is his view, uh, that basically these two events shared some common features, the pouring out of the Spirit and some visible proof of it, one by speaking in tongues in Acts, the other by people dreaming dreams. And it awaits its ultimate fulfillment in the millennial blessings. He's not confusing, Peter's not confusing two dispensations, rather he's comparing the two blessings. And that's Mr. Ryrie's view. Now, let me give you the third view, and this is the view that I would take, okay? And that is this, the near fulfillment view. So, in other words, part of Joel was fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, but there's more to come, okay? And so there was a fulfillment of Joel's words, but they don't deny or preclude a further fulfillment in a latter-day time frame. And so it's vital to notice that Peter, by the Holy Spirit, makes some changes to the quotations from Joel and introduces some explanations, which are found in the not found in the Hebrew text or, or the Septuagint Greek. So one is that he changes afterwards. We've already seen to the last days, and so the latter days is an expression of the the great age of messianic fulfillment. Uh, of course, Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 3 says, has in these last days spoken us to us by his son. So really, the last days began with the coming of Christ and his, his death, burial, resurrection. You can't have a second coming until you've had a first coming. <laughs> so the last days began with the coming of Christ. Okay, And so the, these events are going to occur in the last days. We want to accept that and, and certainly embrace that. And so Peter says, not just afterwards, but he says, in the last days. And so great messianic age fulfillment. The outpouring is a signal indicating that the end time era has arrived. And the New Testament event oh, certainly connects the events concerning Christ's first coming with the last days. And so certainly that would be how Peter was be saying, the last days have come with the coming of Christ. Now the spirit will be poured out. Supernatural signs will happen on earth and sky and salvation will be granted to those whom the Lord shall call. But Peter, when he emphasizes in his prophecy uh, or in his preaching, he emphasizes the pouring out of the spirit and he certainly puts great emphasis on whosoever will call on the name of the Lord, but he's he's not so much putting a great emphasis on the signs and wonders in the heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, basically because they weren't evident on that day. And so they're going to come in a future day. And so evidently not everything in Joel's prophecy took place on the day of Pentecost. There were no signs in the heaven that day, Okay. The, you couldn't say with any clarity 
that on the day of Pentecost, uh, the, the, the wonders in heaven above, sign in the earth beneath, blood and fire, vapor of smoke, sun turned to darkness, the moon turned to blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. Those things did not happen on the day of Pentecost. What did happen on the day of Pentecost was the Spirit of God was poured out on all those that were believers in the Lord Jesus, repentant believers on him, irrespective of, because there were men and women in the upper room, they were all filled with the Spirit. We also notice that on that day too, um, th th there's a call to whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be delivered. And so there's a gospel application. That's why, in my mind, I think Peter quoted the whole of Joel's prophecy. I think he quoted the whole thing rather than just the first part because he wanted to include the gospel appeal. He wanted to finish his sermon with an appeal for men to respond. Whoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. He wanted to get that in there. And in order to do that, he quotes the whole prophecy. But it's not all fulfilled on that day more is to come in the latter days. And so kind of in, in, in conclusion and in summary, it's clear that Peter sees in the outpouring of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost a preliminary fulfillment of Joel's prophecy, right? The pouring out of the Spirit. It's not now just on individuals for certain acts of service, but for all that trust in the Lord, they receive the Holy Spirit. So, so there's a preliminary fulfillment but there's more to come. The last days have commenced and they'll continue right up to the second coming of Christ and there will be a further outpouring of the Spirit on a future day when Israel look on him whom they've pierced when they're born again in one day and there's going to be an outpouring of the Spirit and it will be on all that call on the name of the Lord in that day. That's a future. Now, we also would say this, that in the church age, there have also been subsequent outpourings of the Spirit. We call them revival. <laughs> and I want to just say this. I want to quote a verse from Hebrews. I want you to just uh, keep your finger in, in uh, Joel. But Hebrews chapter 6, another controversial chapter <laughs> for sure. But one thing we can be sure of, and I love this scripture, Hebrews 6 verse 5. It says, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. I like that. Every time there's a revival, it's usually connected with an outpouring of the Spirit of God on his people uh, in a powerful way. And what's happening is we're getting a taste of the powers of the age to come, the millennial age. And oftentimes in times of sweeping revivals, people will talk in terms like this. They'll say, it's like heaven has come down to earth. Police stations are closed. Crime goes to zero. People are worshiping the Lord everywhere. The presence of God is everywhere. It's tasting the powers of the age to come, by the way. Wouldn't it be wonderful if before the terrible coming of the day of the Lord, we are part of and experience a great outpouring of the Spirit of God, and we actually taste the powers of the world to come. We're praying for that. Some of us want to see that and enjoy that and experience that. So back in Joel now, in verse 30, Joel at chapter 2, verse 30 and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So the same Lord who poured out the Spirit is he who is also going to show these wonders in the heavens. He's going to set them up there. These signs are the acts of deity. These are not some natural phenomena that can be explained away. I will show wonders in the heavens. God is going to do these things. And so they're supernatural acts of God, of deity. In the sky and on the earth, men will be astounded by what will happen. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood. And so this, this sense of darkness permeating, just like in the days uh, of the plagues of Egypt, remember that there was darkness in the whole land except 
there was light in the dwellings of the Israelites. God is able to even distinguish, but there was darkness over the, the whole earth, as it were, or the whole land of Egypt. And so uh, Christ's coming, there were, there were supernatural signs, weren't they? God, as it were, sent a star. He lit up the heavens. And so at the time of his death, again, there was a supernatural darkness that enveloped Calvary. Uh, likewise, at his second coming, there will be global a global midnight darkness, which will suddenly be dispelled by the lightning and brightness of his coming. Let me just read from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24. And just want you to see that, because I think the earth is going to be very, very dark, not just spiritually, but literally prior to the Lord coming uh, at his second advent. Uh, Matthew 24, verse 29 and 30, it says, And there shall appear, uh, so immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light. The stars shall fall from heaven. The powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So again, just that idea of sudden darkness dispelled by the lightning and brightness of his coming. Because the moon turned to blood doesn't mean that it's going to become physically the substance of blood, but it's going to turn to the color of blood. It'll be like what we call a blood red moon. Uh, and again, we there's a lot of talk about people being writing prophecy books about things happening on blood red moons. And so uh, it was, it's, it's going to look like blood. It's going to be Turned red, bright red. So that's the picture here. Uh, God is going to bring about these things, blood and fire. So I want to just say, again, we believe that those things were not filled on the day of Pentecost, uh, fulfilled, but that they are yet to be fulfilled. And so let's just look at some of the examples of these things meeting fulfillment in Revelation. So this could be a bit of review, but let's look at Revelation chapter 8. And verse 7 and 8, where we have the reference of blood and fire uh, in Joel's prophecy, Reve Revelation 8, verse 7, it says, And the second angel sounded, it was where a great mountain burning with fire was cast to the sea. Third part of the sea became blood. Third part of the creatures that were in the sea and had life died. Third part of the ships were destroyed. Did I read the ones right ones? No, verse seven and verse eight. I'm sorry. The first angel sounded, there followed hail and fire mingled with blood. Okay, so there you've got blood and fire mixed together. <clears throat> hail and fire mingled with blood. They were cast upon the earth. And then, of course, uh, he talks about smoke. Uh, again, in Joel's prophecy, uh, chapter nine of Revelation, verse 18. It reads, by these three were the third part of men killed by the fire, by the smoke, by the brimstone, which issued out of their mouths. Uh, and we, back in chapter 8 and verse 12, we have the fourth angel sounded and the third part of the sun was smitten, the third part of the moon, third part of the stars. So the third part of them was darkened. The day shone not for a third part of it, the night likewise. So again, we got uh, this idea of darkness that's referred to in Revelation 6 and verse 12, the moon turning to blood. We have the same thought in Revelation 6, 12. So it says, and, I, and behold, when he had opened the sixth seal, lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And so basically, what we're simply saying is, part of Joel's prophecy, we saw a pre-fulfillment of it on the day of Pentecost, but there's more to come. And this more to come is going to occur during that great terrible day of the Lord, leading up to the second advent of the Lord Jesus. And our time is gone. I can't believe that because uh, I thought we'd be done this passage, but may the Lord encourage us with the things we've considered. Amen.